Hello, this is Graham. In this video, we're going to be looking at psychological defences and how they're regarded in Carl Rogers' person-centred approach. To begin with, it helps to remind ourselves of a little bit of person-centred theory. One of the core conditions that many people are aware of within the person-centred approach is unconditional positive regard. I've said that I'll do a video on this separately soon. For the therapist to be able to provide unconditional positive regard, they need to feel that they can, at the deepest level, trust their client. This trust is possible because no matter who the person is or what they've done in the past, those of us who practice person-centred therapy believe in the capacity of every human to work towards their greatest potential. If you can't see people in this way, you probably aren't going to be a person-centred therapist. Apparently, Carl Rogers used to describe a scene from his childhood. His parents lived in a house with a basement and they stored their potatoes in there throughout the year. There was a small window that let in a tiny amount of light. The potatoes would begin to sprout and the sprouts would grow towards the light. Despite their desperate fate, despite their deprived environment, despite the lack of any form of nourishment or stimulation, they invariably sprouted and tried to reach their fullest potential. According to the humanistic school, and especially the person-centred branch, this is a natural quality of human beings too. Every human being has the capacity to work towards their greatest potential. This is the self, the true self, ideal self, or organismic self. On the other hand, the real self or self-concept is how we perceive ourselves to be. All humans have the need for positive regard, in other words, approval. If they receive this, then they have few obstacles in their path to becoming their ideal self. A psychologically healthy person, then, is someone who is actively working towards their ideal self, bringing the real and the ideal into alignment without any serious psychological hindrances. In the person-centred uh, language, they are congruent. I've already produced a video about congruence, which is often misunderstood by students and confused with authenticity. The psychologically healthy individual trusts their own perception of things and is therefore able to take decisions for themselves. They become more self-aware, trusting their emotional perception and judgment and being prepared to draw on these in assessing situations. They are not intimidated by others and so are more likely to be open to new experiences. Our real self or self-concept develops from infancy onwards and is heavily dependent on the attitudes of the people around us, especially our significant carers. If these people give us the unconditional positive regard that we need, then we are likely to be healthy and to be working towards our ideal self. If, on the other hand, they make their recognition of us conditional or they only give us negative feedback, then we will struggle to focus on our work towards self-actualization. To begin with, we become desperate for positive regard. We become so busy trying to fulfil the needs of these others in order to gain approval for ourselves that we have no time or energy left to pursue our true potential. This makes us even more vulnerable to interjected conditions of worth, believing what others tell us we are. Condemned, humiliated or punished in this way, we internalise these values and develop a self-concept that defines us as inadequate and worthless. Soon we lose sight of our potential completely. One of the fundamentals of person-centred theory is that our behaviour is determined both by external factors and how we feel about ourselves on the inside. Trapped like this, we become increasingly disturbed. At this point, our journey can follow one of at least two paths. Firstly, we may invest in behaviour that reinforces these negative self-beliefs. This might involve the use of substances, hostility, abuse and anger. We enter a spiralling downwards, adopting behaviour that lives up to our terrible self-perception by being increasingly so extreme that we even disappoint ourselves, thereby reinforcing the negative self-belief 
that we truly are worthless. As if this wasn't tragic enough, the further twist in the knife is that we know, we become increasingly aware that we are deliberately making ourselves feel inadequate, even at being inadequate. The discomfort that this produces is recognised in other therapeutic theories too. The psychoanalytic school, for example, describes the anxiety that arises at this time as a signal that we have reached a point where we feel most vulnerable. The alternative path is to shut off our senses of how our significant others are responding to us to become oblivious to them. We continue to internalise the values, but we're increasingly unaware of how these people see us. We begin to believe that we're a different person, adopting a persona of being honourable, loving and responsible. Other people around us probably see this virtuous person too, but they don't realise that beneath it, we are desperately seeking their approval. In both cases, the individual who is living a life in chaos and the one who is ruled by the need to conform to a false picture of themselves, their sense of self depends on the responses of others towards them. People who confirm their belief in themselves are accepted and their views integrated. Against those who try to dissuade them, they resort to what we call defence mechanisms or coping strategies. Different therapeutic theories have different ways of perceiving and working with the defences. The person-centred theorists see two fundamental kinds, denial and distortions, mainly distortions of perception, how things are looked at. Denial is seen as the most challenging to work with in therapy. For example, the virtuous person might be incapable of taking part in a meeting without displaying anger towards their colleagues. Asked about this, they deny that it is anger or even wrong and instead describe it as being open, speaking sincerely, speaking to truth and so on. The role of therapy is not to eliminate these forms of defence. To do so would be impossible and counterproductive. Imagine what the impact would be if someone had no way of defending their ego against attacks. It sounds like a curse from Harry Potter. Instead, from the person-centred perspective, our job is to liberate the individual from the shackles of the interjected values and their defence of them, so that they can begin to discover their true self and work towards self-actualization. While their interpretation will vary from one theoretical model to another, the defences are often described in more detail by the psychoanalytic community. I've already mentioned that they see anxiety as a signal that the defences are being activated. Much of the early work on defences was done by Anna Freud, the daughter of Sigmund Freud. In 1936, she published a book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defence. The behaviours described are observable by any therapist. It's the interpretation of them that will differ. She identified 10 at this stage, however, she concentrated on five, repression, regression, projection, reaction formation and sublimation. The psychiatrist George Valent, whose work you came across when studying positive psychology, published a classification of the defences in 1977. His work is seen as largely well evidenced and was used in the DSM 4 with relatively minor changes. He suggested that the defences could be considered in four levels. The pathological are serious and need to be addressed. The mature still need to be acknowledged and underlying provocations of them can benefit from exploring, but they were not fundamentally dangerous. The immature and neurotic ones are probably the ones most therapists encounter regularly. So a quick summary. If we do not receive the kind of unconditional positive regard that we need, especially in our childhood, but instead are fed conditionally or negatively, then we begin to believe that we are worthless. If this persists, we become increasingly desperate for approval. 
Eventually, we lose the capacity to even conceive that we have any potential, let alone to seek to work towards it. We reach a point where we make a choice. On the one hand, we can begin to behave in increasingly bad ways, so that we live up to the overwhelming sense of inadequacy. We reach a place where even we get shocked at how inadequate we are at being inadequate, as we seek to outdo our previous bad behaviour. Alternatively, we can continue to interject the conditions of bad worth that are being hurled at us, but turn off our senses to them. In this place of being cut off from the world, we reinvent ourselves. We adopt behaviours that society esteems, becoming pillars of our community, virtuous people. Others may see this and applaud us, but under the surface, we remain desperate for approval. When we're in these conditions, if anything happens to make us feel that our values are threatened, we resort to the use of defences. We aim to preserve our status quo. These defences have been classified in different ways, but the important thing to remember is that we are not seeking to eliminate them. Without defences, we would be exceptionally vulnerable. Instead, we aim to improve our awareness of them, dropping the most extreme and allowing ourselves to use others in a more proportionate way. The aim of person-centred therapy is to support the client while they re-evaluate their conditions of self-worth, to understand how they defend themselves and how to adopt more control over these ways, so that they are ultimately able to work towards their true potential and self-actualisation. Thank you.